hope you enjoyed your break. I hope you filled up on beer. I hope you're ready for our next speaker. Our next speaker is a third year graduate student at the University of Washington. Our next speaker is not just a speaker, she is also a singer in a rock band. This rock band is called Night Lunch, and its first album is coming out this winter. You should listen to it, it's amazing. Please join me in welcoming Natalie Nicole Sanchez. summer 
uh, when we were putting together our galaxy waffles. And this is a lovely example of a galaxy waffle, plus the very nice diagram that I asked for uh, of their galaxy waffle. And I'd like to particularly point out this uh, instruction that I give them, because even though I'm a grad student, which means I can't even possibly imagine thinking about having children, uh, I know <laughs> that if you were to give a bottle of syrup to a bunch of 12 year olds, that would be mayhem, right? So they have to come up to me, they have to show me their galaxy waffle plus their lovely diagram to get syrup. And the syrup is representing the gas in the galaxy, right? Because that's what you're making your stars out of, so there's gonna be a lot of this, Etc. Etc. So I was really excited about this. This is my second year that I've been doing it, and so I posted this photo exactly on Twitter, and I was like really excited. I gave instructions about how to make a galaxy waffle, and my advisor, like I mentioned, had some concerns. <laughs> so she was like, "Hey, you're serving your waffle wrong. It should be served in a fishbowl of syrup." <laughs> and then in response to this, the chair of my department, the one who created that beautiful image in the question was like, wait, you actually need a syrup fountain which is launching out from within the waffle. <laughs> to which my advisor then retorted, also, you need at least three fire hoses full of syrup just aimed straight at the waffle. <laughs> Where are the fire hoses of syrup? I ask you with our little waffle. Oh wait, let me, uh, right, let's get back to some science. So where is this gas that they're talking about, right? Because the syrup was representing the gas in the waffle, in the galaxies. Um, so where are we seeing this, uh, where are we seeing all this gas? And really the dilemma here is that this is a bit too simplified, uh, a diagram of a galaxy. So here's another beautiful image of a galaxy where you can actually see an example of a tidal stream due to a previous merger that happened with another galaxy. Uh, and the reason that you're able to see this stream is because there's enough gas, in fact, enough gas that you're forming a little bit of stars in here, but there's enough gas that it's dense enough for your eye to pick it out. But there's actually tons of gas around really all galaxies in what's called the circumgalactic medium, which really just represents a gaseous halo that surrounds galaxies. And so if I were to update that simplified diagram that I showed you previously, it looks something like this where you have, you know, here's your disk of your galaxy, your supermassive black hole, don't forget about it, it's right there in the center, uh, and you have all of this gas that you can't see that's too diffuse to see coming into the galaxy from the ambient uh, universe, coming out of the galaxy due to the energetics within it, uh, and some of it which falls back out, and some of it which leaves the galaxy entirely. Uh, and all of this gas is really important for forming stars, for feeding the black hole, it's important to the evolution of these galaxies. So how do I study these? Uh, I know that this video is actually not gonna work because it's too big, so I'm gonna move this. But I use, thank you. I use what are called cosmological hydrodynamic simulations, which basically means that I put a bunch of particles in a box and turn on gravity and let time happen. Uh, and in particular, I look for, I'll run a really big one of these to take into account the large scale structure of the universe and run it just with dark matter and then I'll find a halo of the mass that I'm interested in, of uh, Milky Way halo mass and then I'll re-simulate that, I'll zoom into that little region in my big box and I'll throw in gas and you know the physics to make stars and the physics to make black holes and I'll let that run for another you know 13.8 billion simulation years uh, and then I end up with a Milky Way mass galaxy uh, and this allows me to study the evolution of these galaxies. Right, so in particular, I use these simulations to study the circumgalactic meaning, medium of Milky Way-like galaxies, and I say Milky Way-like because they're of the same mass, uh, and some of them have this, some of them don't, uh, but I'm looking at the circumgalactic medium of these galaxies, and in particular, I'm interested, as I've mentioned multiple times, in the supermassive black hole and its possible effect on, on the CGM, on the circumgalactic medium, and I put this little asterisk 
near if, because actually studying the CDM is a fairly new prospect. Uh, it wasn't until 2010 that we had an instrument, uh, Cost Halos, which is on uh, the Hubble telescope, a little shout out. Um, and it was able to look at this really diffuse gas finally, and we were able to start studying this kind of mysterious uh, gaseous region that we haven't been able to study before. So, oh, there we go. So, and the reason that we're interested in studying uh, the supermassive black hole with relation to the CGM is that we know that the supermassive black hole does have a tie to its host galaxy. So this is called the M sigma relation. It is uh, a plot of the mass of a supermassive black hole and the galactic dynamics of the galaxy that it lives in. In particular, it's the velocity dispersion of the bulge. Uh, we don't have to worry about that much, uh, worry about that too much. But the key thing here is that the fact that this is such a tight relation that these kind of fall along this line here means that the supermassive black hole and the galaxy that it lives in must grow together. And your next question might be, well, how does it do that? Uh, and it kind of comes back to this idea of feedback. Now, feedback is the energy that is released by a black hole when it starts to uh, accrete material, right? It's eating up gas, it's starting to grow, and it can release this energy, and that energy can influence its surroundings. But that's actually kind of surprising. Is it surprising? It is surprising. Uh, kind of. Because supermassive black holes, despite the fact that they are supermassive, are actually pretty small. One of the greatest things I think I've ever read in an like, astrophysical journal was this comparison between a supermassive black hole's size and its host galaxy. And they compared it to the Cairo International Airport to the entire size of the Sahara Desert. And that's kind of wild, right? You have this thing that's not that big, but has enough energy or has enough influence on this large, amazing thing that it lives inside of. And now, so we know now that these things like the sigma relationship must co-evolve. And we also know that galaxies depend on their CGM for their evolution as well. So that brings us kind of to the, well, the, really the crux of my research, the very basic, or the most basic uh, question that I'm trying to ask. Does the supermassive black hole play a role in shaping the CGM? And I'm gonna be honest with you, it does. <laughs> So this is actually uh, a plot from my own research, where I'm showing that the these are this is the mass of metals in the CGM, and astronomers have a pretty simple definition of metals. It's anything that's not hydrogen. Uh, and I'm there's a photo of the galaxy, so there's a lot more closer to the galaxy, and it's decreasing as you go out. And really, the key things that I want you to notice about here, uh, P0, GM1, GM2, GM3, those are just the names of four different simulated galaxies. And the solid lines here are, get, are uh, the simulations that I ran kind of normally, right? They had physics for star formation, they had gas in them, uh, and they had physics for black holes. Uh, and then the dash line, I actually removed the ability uh, basically, I just said, no stars, you're not allowed to turn, you're not allowed to turn into black holes. And uh, so I removed black hole physics from those simulations. And then I looked at this metal mass. And I noticed, hey, in, when I remove black holes, you're not getting as much metal out into the CGM. Oh, this little spike here, there's like a merger coming in at, in that particular galaxy, which is interesting, but not what we're focusing on right now. But what is interesting is that the, this uh, kind of points to this idea that the supermassive black hole is actually really vital to the evolution of the CGM because it's moving all of this, all of this metal that's being created in the hearts of stars and the disk of the galaxy, and it's propagating them out into the CGM, meaning that without the black hole, we cannot, pro uh, we cannot shape the CGM the way that it looks like and the way that observers have seen it today. And that's, oh, yes. The way that observers have seen it today. In lieu of a summary, I leave you with instructions on how you can make your own galaxy waffles. And I thank you all, and we'll take questions.
The question is, what is inside the supermassive black hole? Presumably everything that it has accreted, but according to Interstellar, the answer of the universe and its love, right? <laughs> That's a really great question. So uh, someone was asking about the models that I use, right? The, the uh, cosmological simulations that I'm using and whether they're accurate and whether we can trust them, right? Because we're putting particles in the box and kind of applying physics to them. And the way that we compare them and kind of decide whether or not they are valid is by uh, comparing them to observations. So the, actually, uh, so the simulations that I use are written by, or made in a code called Chandra. And this particular code is really good at matching particular relations that we see. They, it makes galaxies that look like galaxies that we can see. Uh, it's, you know, supermassive black, like the relation just, the relation that I showed, like the M sigma, it matches that with the galaxies that it makes. It matches some other relations. And due to those things, we say, okay, because we're making galaxies the way that we predict, or we, we see that they look, now we can, you know, start to trust them as, all right, I'm going to use this, trying to determine the physics of the evolution of the galaxy. I think we're out of questions. Okay, well, thank you very much. Keep going, Michael. Next meeting is October 24th. I hope to see you all there. Have a good night.